there is a treasure trove of strange and mysterious creatures inside a book we've known for thousands of years. The Bible is full of beasts. Did they really exist? Can they be found today, or are they just myth? Investigators are now re-examining the Bible, finding clues that will help us solve the mysteries surrounding miraculous animals. We now can find Jonah's whale, but it's not in the sea. The staff of Moses did not turn into a snake. We can dig up something bigger. If we can uncover Behemoth and Leviathan, tradition says we have to eat the monsters. Oh my god, look how long it is! And the serpent with legs in the Garden of Eden may actually exist. This is an amazing sight. To uncover the secrets, we need to decode ancient writings and unlock the hidden meanings inside symbols, myths, and legends. If we succeed, we will come face to face with the most mysterious beasts in the Bible. The most infamous beast in the Bible is the serpent, the most sinister inhabitant of the Garden of Eden. It was the serpent that tempted Eve. In the book of Genesis, the serpent has some disturbing characteristics. The traditional belief is that it was a creature with legs. The serpent found Eve in the garden and told her to taste the fruit from the tree of knowledge, the only fruit that God had forbidden both Adam and Eve to eat. If she ate the fruit, the serpent told Eve she would be like God and know the difference between good and evil. Tempted, Eve bit into the fruit and then shared it with Adam. And so God banished Adam and Eve from the garden and he cursed the serpent. On your belly you shall crawl and dust you will eat all the days of your life. The ancients said that this is the curse that changed the serpent into a snake. Its legs torn from its body. It's not surprising that this sinful tale has marked serpents with nasty reputations. For the ancients, these creatures always had dark and magical qualities. There's something unnatural about their movements and character. And a snake with legs? Well, that's just creepy. There could never have been such a creature. Or could there? Surprisingly, 
Ancient Christian manuscripts provide us with several candidates. For centuries, the word serpent was applied to a number of different beasts with similar characteristics. There are detailed catalogues of these creatures that just may lead us to Eve's legged serpent. This is an 800-year-old bestiary, a book of beasts. Bestiaries are part of uh, an extraordinarily long-lived tradition uh, going into the Middle Ages, but one which has its roots going way back into the classical world. The one I'm looking at, dated to around the 12th century, you can actually see the pores of skin where the hide of the animal has been scraped, the hair has been scraped away, and on the other side you can see the veins on the flesh side. So it's a book about beasts, and it's made from the skin of beasts. In the ancient bestiaries, great attention was given to bizarre, exotic, and monstrous creatures. And the possible suspects for Eve's serpent, the legged snakes and salamanders, played the most powerful roles. Here in this bestiary, a remarkable picture uh, pertaining to the salamander, quite different from the creatures that we know today. We have a dead man lying on the ground. We have to the right a series of snake-like salamanders emerging from flames. And on the other side, the tail of a salamander disappearing into a well to infect it. And above, a spreading tree with salamanders winding round the branches to eat the apples and infect them to kill the man below. The salamander is what it says. I'll translate part of it. Among all poisonous creatures, it has the greatest power. For other poisonous creatures, kill one by one. But this creature kills very many people at the same time. For if it snakes its way into a tree, it can infect all the apples with poison. And anyone who eats those apples, it kills. Because this text mentions the salamander poisoning apples by climbing into a tree, very early on, it gets associated then with the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Could the serpent described in Genesis be a poisonous salamandra? If we go back in time, long before these bestiaries were written, we find a biblical commentary over 1,600 years old, and in it, Eve's serpent has some tree poisoning talents. In this text called the Apocalypse of Moses, Eve tells her children her own version of what happened with the tree and the serpent. And in her version, she says that the serpent poured the poison of his wickedness, which is lust, into the fruit of the tree and then took and bent down the branch low so that Eve could reach it. And she reached and took the fruit and ate of it. And as soon as she did, she knew everything had changed. This manuscript tells us that the serpent in Genesis poisoned the fruit of the tree before giving it to Eve, and the later bestiary image shows the creature known as the salamandra doing exactly the same thing. It leads us to a surprising new theory. The biblical serpent with legs may actually have been a salamander. Amazingly, many salamanders living today are poisonous. But could they really be powerful enough to poison the fruit of a tree? This little guy is a fire salamander. When he's full grown, he'll measure about 10 inches long. Now he's called a fire salamander for two reasons. Number one, his skin is marked with a very fiery pattern, so a warning to predators. He has these beautiful vivid yellow and orange markings on his body, which advertise the fact that he secretes venom onto his skin, which is why I'm gonna to have to wash my hands carefully after handling this little guy. In the Middle Ages, it was thought that they are highly venomous to the extent that there were legends about how a single salamander poisoned a river and killed thousands of people. In truth, the venom is not particularly powerful, certainly not enough to kill a person. The other reason why he's called a fire salamander is because of the ancient belief that he's generated in fire. People thought that salamanders were born in fire, 
and the medieval commentators explain that blood therefore renders one fireproof. There is a long tradition associating the salamander with flames and hellfire. People believe that the salamander couldn't be burned, just like the souls of the damned that remained unconsumed by the fires of hell. These devilish characteristics certainly make the beast an obvious candidate for Eve's satanic serpent. The belief in the creature's magical fireproof properties probably originates from a behavior common to many species of salamander, hibernating in rotting logs. When wood was brought indoors and put on the fire, the creatures mysteriously appeared from the flames. People began to believe that the salamander could grow fireproof wool, withstand any heat, and even put out fires. Now this little guy doesn't have any wool, and he can't live in fire either. In fact, everything we know about modern science tells us that no creature is generated from fire. And many people likewise dismiss the idea of salamander blood having fireproof characteristics as being nothing more than an ancient myth with no basis in fact. However, zoologists have recently discovered that newts and salamanders do possess fireproof characteristics, not in their blood, but rather in various liquid secretions. Salamanders have glands which secrete fluids over their body to keep them moist. Now, zoologists have observed that when these salamanders pass through fire, they start secreting these fluids over their body. The fluids then froth up into a foam, which amazingly means that the salamander is able to pass through the flames unharmed. The foam dissipates the heat from their bodies. So as much as people today might dismiss the entire legend of the fireproof salamander as myth, we see that there is truth to it, as amazing as that is. So, the ancients had it right. The salamander can secrete poison and walk through flames. But is this the legged serpent that tempted Eve? It turns out that the salamander is not our best candidate. The positive traditions surrounding the creature beat out its bad reputation. It was used most often to represent the good and holy, like saints that could withstand the flames of torture. The salamander even became a symbol for Jesus after his crucifixion on his journey through the fires of hell. And so, associating the holy salamander with the sinful serpent that tempted Eve is a contradiction. But there are other contenders. If we go even further back in time, not just centuries, but millions of years, we find evidence for an extraordinary prehistoric predator that resembles the Genesis description. And that may lead us to a living serpent with legs. Today, biologists and paleontologists regard the story of the serpent with legs in the Garden of Eden as simply that, a story. But surprisingly, they do have something to say about snakes with legs. To the left, we have a savanna monitor lizard. And in my hand to the right here, we have a boa constrictor. Two animals that look superficially very different from each other. But we know from looking at their anatomy, the fossil record, and their genetic sequences, that these animals share a common ancestor about 100 million years ago. The snake body plan evolved from a body very similar to what we see in this lizard with four limbs, a short trunk, and a long tail into the body that we see in this boa with a very long trunk, no four limbs at all, and no shoulder girdle, and a very, very short tail. And amazingly enough, if you look at some species of snakes today, you can still see the remains of their hind limbs. In this ball python, we can see the remnants of the hind limbs as these very small little spurs at the base of the tail. Within these spurs are very small thigh bones, the femora, which are the only remaining elements left of the hind limb and primitive snakes. It's hard to believe these tiny spurs are evidence that snakes once had legs, but recent discoveries of ancient fossils reinforce the theory. These fossils were recovered from shallow marine rocks dated between 99 and 95 million years old. 
These snakes show the body plan that we can see in living snakes, such as this python. The amazing thing about these snakes is that complete skeletons have been recovered that include external hind limbs, including feet and toes. Could this really be the fossil of an ancient snake leg? It just so happens that there is more evidence connecting this 95 million year old leg to modern snakes. Many living snakes today possess a specialized form of feeding called wide gape feeding. Wide gape feeding in snakes is a specialization where the bones of the skull and the jaw joint are actually suspended far behind the rest of the head relative to other lizards. This allows snakes to have a very long lower jaw that can swing out very deeply. Additionally, the bones of the lower jaw are not fused at the front of the mouth as they are in mammals and other animals. Instead, these two bones remain separate and when a snake opens its mouth, they're able to swing wide apart to create a very deep gape, which allows snakes to eat a variety of large-bodied prey. Biologists consider wide gape feeding an advanced characteristic found only in snakes. The 99 million year old skulls discovered among recent fossils show adaptations for wide gape feeding. It means that these ancient skulls are definitely snake not lizard, not dinosaur. And because the skulls are attached to skeletal bodies that have legs, they just may be a direct link connecting modern snakes to ancient snakes with legs. Could a fossil snake with legs be the great, great, great grandfather of all modern snakes? It's an interesting idea especially when comparing the Genesis story to the evolution of snakes. In the Garden of Eden, after being cursed by God, the serpent loses its legs. Modern science points to the fossil record and millions of years of evolution to show the same result. The serpent lost its legs as it evolved to burrow. Today, primitive living snakes are all burrowers, which has led some people to conclude that snakes actually originated their elongate body plan and reduced limbs for a burrowing lifestyle. And there is a burrowing beast that exists today that biologists classify under squamata, the same lineage as all snakes and lizards. It is in the strange subcategory of Amphisbania, the worm lizards, where we find yet another suspect for Eve's serpent with legs. This is the bipes. These subterranean amphisbanians have two powerful front legs. Each foot has five sharp claws that allow the bipes to tunnel efficiently through the soil. They spend most of their time in shallow tunnels feeding on ants, termites, and larvae. This particular species can be found in Baja California and Mexico, but it has close relatives in the Mediterranean and the Middle East. The legged serpent, a creature considered by most as only mythical, may actually exist today. The salamander, the amphisbania, the prehistoric snake, all three possess, or at one time possessed, legs. Exactly what kind of creature the Book of Genesis tells us God cursed may never be known. But we now have three possible suspects. Or perhaps we have three descendants of the serpent that tempted Eve. Whether legged or legless, the serpent was an incredible symbol of power. It appears in many verses of the Bible and even slithers into the hands of Moses, which leads us to another mystery. But this time, the secret is inside a rod, and the serpent transforms into something much more powerful. The ancient Hebrew of the Bible describes fantastic beasts that are incredible symbols of power. But modern translations often contain mistakes that are misleading. By going back to the original text, 
we can uncover animals lost to us for centuries. And one of the most beastly secrets in the Bible slithers beside the serpent that God gave to Moses. It is written that God's voice came to Moses from a burning bush. He told Moses to free the Hebrews from Pharaoh's slavery, lead them out of Egypt and into the promised land. He assured Moses that he would help him to perform wonders, to convince the Egyptians of his power. He commanded Moses to throw down his staff. The ancient texts tell us that the staff of Moses transformed into a nachash. Nachash in Hebrew means snake. Grab it by its tail, said God. And Moses did. The snake turned back into a rod. And so Moses went back to Egypt to enlist his brother Aaron. It was time to take the rod and challenge Pharaoh. In ancient Israel and in ancient Egypt, a rod was more than just a walking stick. It was a symbol of power. It represented leadership and authority. In Hebrew, the word is mateh. And mateh means rod, but it also has another meaning, which is tribe. And so Mete is not only the rod that the leader holds, but also the tribe over which the leader has power. In Exodus, we're told that Moses' tribe was in trouble. Pharaoh had enslaved his people, and so he and Aaron travel into the heart of Egypt to challenge Pharaoh, to shout their now famous words, let my people go. But this time, the Bible tells us God placed a mighty power in Aaron's rod. The Bible makes it clear that it was Aaron, the brother of Moses, who threw the rod before Pharaoh. Sure that the Hebrews' God was powerless, Pharaoh demands to see a miracle. And Aaron throws down his staff. Back at the burning bush, when Moses threw down his staff, it transformed into a nachash, a snake. And most translations of the Exodus story describe the same thing happening for Aaron. But they've got it all wrong. That's not at all what materialized in front of Pharaoh. The original Hebrew tells us that when Aaron threw down his rod, it transformed into a tanim, a beast considered to be so powerful by the Egyptians that they dedicated entire temples to the creature. Constructed with such devotion that the massive ruins still stand 3,000 years later. What kind of beast was this tanim? Why was it so revered? And how does it change our understanding of the Bible? When Moses and Aaron go before Pharaoh and Aaron throws down his staff, it turns into a tanin. Now the word tanin is used here in reference to that stated in the book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel speaks of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, as being the great tanin who lives in the river Nile and declares himself king and creator of all his surroundings. What is the great tanin in the river Nile? It's the Nile crocodile, the number one predator in Egypt. The way Ezekiel tells it, God compared Pharaoh to the great Tanim crouching in the river. And then God warned the crocodile, I will put hooks in your jaws, and I will pull you out of your streams. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, is symbolically represented as being the great Nile crocodile. And so, for centuries, there has been a mistranslation of Tanim probably stemming back to when the Bible was translated from Hebrew to Greek. But Ezekiel makes it clear that a tanin is not a snake. So in the book of Exodus, when Aaron challenges Pharaoh and throws down his staff, God gives him control of a monstrous Nile crocodile. 
Pharaoh calls to his priests, commanding them to throw down their staffs. And so begins the battle. What is the significance behind the fact that Aaron's rod transformed into a crocodile when challenging the ruler of Egypt? The mystery surrounding this biblical beast begins here. On these great stone columns and walls is evidence that one of the oldest and most revered of the Egyptian deities was the crocodile god, Sobek. We are in the temple of Kamombo in the southern part of Egypt, lying on the banks of the Nile. It's an unusual temple because it's dedicated to the infinitely glamorous crocodile god, Sobek. Sobek was often shown as a man with a crocodile head, or just as a crocodile. Sobek was one of the most important gods in the Egyptian pantheon. He was probably one of the top 10 or 15 gods. And over time, his popularity grew and grew. Part of this was because he was a combination of a fertility god and a sun god. The ancient Egyptians chose a crocodile for Sobek because they believed the crocodile had magical powers. Female crocodiles seemed to know when the Nile's waters would flood. Just before the flood, they would lay 18 to 80 eggs. Their nests would always be above the line of the flood and therefore never disturbed by the rushing waters. The other thing, of course, is that crocodiles spend a lot of time on the sandbanks sunning themselves, and that made them a very ideal choice to be a solar deity. And if you look at the scales of a crocodile, they shine in the light, and they look like gold. And again, this is reflective of the sun. The Egyptians actually had a live crocodile in a pool in the back of the temple, and this was supposed to be the incarnation of the god Sobek, and pilgrims would come and visit him, bringing him offerings of food and drink, meat and bread and even wine, so the crocodile would be appeased. So to kill a sacred crocodile would be an incredible crime. So, in the tale of Exodus, God transforms Aaron's staff into one of Egypt's most celebrated animals. Aaron's control over the mighty Nile crocodile would have challenged Pharaoh's every fiber of belief. It looked as if his god Sobek was in trouble. If Aaron's crocodile could win this battle, how much of a challenge would that be to Pharaoh's power? The recently unearthed mummified remains of 2,000-year-old crocodiles just may hold the answers. Believe it or not, there are secrets inside the belly of this biblical beast. The Bible describes marvelous and fantastic creatures. New investigations into the origins of these beasts have uncovered shocking truths. For centuries, there have been monsters hiding from us in plain sight. It all goes back to a mistranslation in the biblical tale of the Exodus. In the Hebrew text, Aaron's rod does not transform into a snake. It becomes a mighty Nile crocodile. For any pharaoh, this would have been very intimidating. The crocodile was one of Egypt's most revered gods. If Aaron's crocodile could swallow pharaohs, how much kingly power was at stake? 
The true meaning behind the Exodus showdown can finally be uncovered with the help of a crocodile mummy. This crocodile is at least 2,000 years old, but probably more like 2,300 or something like that. Crocodiles were mummified because the Egyptians believed that, of course, you live eternally, and gods, too, are eternal. And they believed that the spirit of the god Sobek came into a sacred crocodile that was in residence at the temple. And when the crocodile died, they would mummify it and bury it with great pomp and splendor because, of course, it was a god. Now, sometimes, so that the crocodiles would keep their shape, they stuffed their internal cavities with papyrus and sometimes they were inscribed. So some of the crocodile mummies are not only interesting because they are mummies of crocodiles, but also because they have given us hundreds and thousands of documents from ancient Egypt. In the early 1900s, hidden in the shifting sands outside the ancient Egyptian town of Teptunis, archeologists uncovered 1,500 crocodile mummies. 31 of these mummies were stuffed with papyri. The crocodile cavities contained a veritable bouillabaisse of ancient texts, spanning not just centuries, but cultures. Amongst the writings were Greek poems and plays, suggesting that the crocodile cult was not only popular with Egyptians. A hundred years later, archaeologists are still unearthing this city. What can the ancient fragments tell us about the significance of Aaron's crocodile in the Exodus story? Can the new discoveries here shine light on our biblical beast? If you're asking crocodile questions in Teptunis, there's only one man to talk to, Claudio Galazzi. And one of this professor's most favorite places to dig is just down this ancient road and outside the walls of another crocodile temple. Now we are beside the temple of uh, the crocodile gods. The most important god of Teptunis was the crocodile. As you can see, beside the temple, we have an uh, empty area. In this empty area, we collect thousands and thousands of papyri. And many papyri fragments unearthed by Galazzi's team contain questions to the crocodile god Sobek. The people wrote on the small paper the question, or sometimes many questions, then presented to the gods in order to have an answer concerning some personal problem. Example, I must go to Alexandria or not? Example, who stole my clothes? Cronion, Irini, or another person? The people present question to the crocodile because the crocodile god was oracular god. An oracular god was considered a wise counselor, able to predict the future. Because the ancient Egyptians witnessed the crocodilian habit of predicting flood lines, never laying eggs too low on the banks of the Nile, they considered the crocodile a psychic deity. After receiving the written notes in the crocodile temple, the priests, apparently channeling Sobek, would provide written answers. The original questions were then buried in the sands outside the temple wall. These small papyri prayers have been sealed shut for over 2,000 years. The secrets they hold can show us the true power behind Pharaoh's crocodile god. Okay. Yes, a few days ago, in this area, in a few square meters, we collect 55 oracular questions that you can see in our laboratory. Some of them contain simple requests Others, advice on marriage. Others still list a variety of suspects for a variety of crimes, asking Sobek to pick out the culprits. 
Uh, actually, it is a name. It is a name of a person, masculine name. Inaros Apolloniou Machimos. Inaros, son of Apollonius, a soldier. So they ask the crocodile god uh, a question concerning this name. All together, they paint a pretty vivid picture. We can see a real picture of the life of uh, more than 2,000 years ago. And what the picture shows is that Sobek, the crocodile god, had become one of the most popular deities in the Middle Kingdom. Romans and Greeks began to believe in the Egyptian god. Moses and Aaron's god would have been up against some serious worship. And so, when we read the correct translation of the Exodus story, and Aaron's rod transforms into a crocodile, not a snake, the symbolism becomes crystal clear. For the first time in millennia, the true meaning behind this biblical beast is unveiled. In the Exodus showdown, when Aaron's crocodile faces Pharaoh's god Sobek, ancient Egypt's entire worldview is at stake. <laughs> According to the Bible, Aaron's crocodile slid across the blood-stained courtyard and gulped down every last one of Pharaoh's reptiles. And Pharaoh's power went down with them all. The Bible tells us that Pharaoh didn't get the message. His heart was stubborn. He ignored the warnings and crocodile casualties, and he refused to free Moses and Aaron's people. It was a mistake that brought disaster upon Egypt. According to the Book of Exodus, God punished Pharaoh and unleashed his many beasts on land and in water. These were the ten biblical plagues, and six of them involved beasts. What's most concerning is that every single one of these mini monsters still exists today. The Bible is full of beasts. But just how literally are we supposed to interpret the monsters of scripture? We've found the answers by re-examining the ancient manuscripts, and what we've uncovered is very real. In the Exodus story, when Pharaoh refused to free the Israelites from slavery, we're told that God unleashed hell upon Egypt. Six of the 10 biblical plagues involved beasts, being small didn't mean these critters weren't deadly. Their incredible numbers made these mini-monsters unbearable. And while some of these creatures are well known, others are shrouded in mystery. After turning the River Nile to blood, the Bible says God commanded Aaron to stretch his staff over the water. Hordes of frogs jumped out and smothered Egypt. To decode what beasts follow the frogs, we have to go back to the original words. Unlike modern English, biblical Hebrew has a very small vocabulary. So one word can mean different things in different contexts. So when we're looking at the biblical plague stories, looking at these words uh, referring to the different plagues, our English translations might be very different from what the ancients who first told and heard these stories were imagining. It's plague number three where the mysteries really begin. The popular understanding of this plague and those that followed is ripe with mistranslation. The third plague is the plague of, in Hebrew, kinim. Kinim means biting insects. Now, a lot of uh, traditional English translations have translated that as the plague of lice, and they do bite, 
but it would make just as much or maybe more sense to translate it as mosquitoes or gnats, which are much more aggressive. The aggressive, blood-sucking and disease-carrying swarms of mosquitoes and gnats sound devastating and make for a much more monstrous plague number three. The fourth plague was flies, or was it something much worse? The fourth plague is the plague of Arov. In Hebrew, Arov refers to a swarm, a swarm of what is less clear. The idea that this was a plague of flies probably goes back to the Septuagint, the Greek translation of Hebrew scriptures. In the Septuagint, the word arov was translated into a Greek word that refers to a dog fly. And so we get, for the fourth plague, a plague of flies. But the Greeks got it wrong. The Hebrew word arov could apply to a mixture of stinging swarms, so, in the tale of Exodus, God most likely sent flies and swarms of stinging insects like hornets and wasps. Now, that's a better plague. According to the Bible, God removed this plague only after Pharaoh promised to release the Hebrews. However, Pharaoh once again broke his promise, and so God unleashed an unspecified killing disease. But exactly what disease was it? The Bible tells us the horses, the donkeys, the camels, all the Egyptian livestock was dead within a day. Perhaps we should look to the smallest but deadliest beast known to man, bacteria. The highly lethal Bacillus anthracis. It's the bacterium in anthrax. Once inside the bloodstream, the anthrax bacilli release toxins that destroy clotting agents, causing horrible tissue destruction and death. It literally causes the infected animal or person to bleed out from every orifice. This microscopic bacterium is only one by nine micrometers in size, but it is one of the most deadly beasts ever unleashed. The biblical description of the fifth plague and its devastation to Egypt's livestock fits with modern scientific descriptions of the effects of anthrax. But according to Exodus chapter 9, this was not the only tiny beast God unleashed. For the sixth plague, God tells Moses and Aaron to go and get ashes from the furnace and take them before Pharaoh and then have Moses throw the ashes up into the heavens and the ashes will spread out across the land of Egypt and cause shaheen on both animals and people. Shaheen in Hebrew uh, usually means boils. This is the plague of boils. Festering skin eruptions on the Egyptians and their livestock an oozing, pus-filled beast that quite likely was another bacteria, perhaps the group Staphylococcus aureus. While not as deadly as anthrax, it is still the cause of life-threatening infections and is the most probable candidate for plague number six. And then came the locusts. The great brown locust, indigenous to Egypt, is about three inches in length it has a large open mouth, two jaws, and four teeth, which work like scissors to grab or cut. According to the Bible, the eighth plague was locusts. Millions and millions of these beasts filled the sky and cast a dark shadow over Egypt. They consumed the fields and trees, eating everything in their path. 